Okay, thank you so much. Can you hear me? Okay, all right. I know I'm between you and lunch, so I promise I will make this fast and hopefully entertaining so that you won't even be thinking about food. But um, as Alicia mentioned, my name is Shubna Gupta, and um, I am a AAAS, which is the American Association for the Advancement of Science, AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellow in NASA's Health and Air Quality Applied Sciences Program. So um, my background is in medicine and neurology, and immediately I was like, yeah, NASA, that makes sense, but not really. But um, I, does anybody think of, you know, just show of hands, when you think of medicine or public health, is NASA the first place that you jump to? No, me neither, exactly. So when I started my policy fellowship, it's almost two years ago now, um, I was really surprised to find this health and air quality office at NASA. And um, turns out NASA has a lot of uh, Earth observation capabilities that are really applicable for public health officials managing uh, health disasters and preventing adverse health events. So NASA has a fleet of Earth observing satellites. We have 18 satellites currently in orbit looking at the Earth and um, looking at a variety of different environmental phenomena which actually affect health. So not only, oh, other way. Um, oh, these 18 satellites orbit the Earth together with airborne flight campaigns, which are flights that have sensors on board. And they look at different parts of the Earth, not only at a, a specific point in time, but continuously. So you have an image, a comprehensive view of the Earth over time, and you can look at how things were in the past and possibly use that data to predict the conditions in the future. So how, does the, how do these satellites look at various environmental phenomena? So on the right, uh, or on the left, excuse me, um, you will see the satellite on board. You see the giant solar panel um, shooting off. Basically, as the satellite orbits the Earth, they have sensors on board. And what they're measuring is radiation coming back from a specific spot over which they're going. So this could be radiation that the Earth is actually emitting out, or uh, radiation that's reflected off from the sun. So the sun's shining on a particular spot, that radiation energy comes back up, and that is what the sensor aboard the satellite measures. Now the radiation that's being collected, the profile of that really depends on the type of surface that it's reflecting back from. So if you're gonna think about for example, an ocean surface, or a mountain range, or a forest, or even like a tiny speck of pollutant in the atmosphere, those different things, those different elements have radiation profiles that are completely different. And because of our satellites looking at these uh, different radiation profiles, we're able to extrapolate information about the Earth, looking at things like rainfall, or the moisture content in soil, or the air quality of a particular region. So these, uh, these profiles allow us to look at the whole Earth as a collection of systems. We have five systems, the lithosphere, which, any guesses? Land, yes. The atmosphere, air, all right, hydrosphere, water, quiet crowd, but that's okay, I can kind of read your lips. All right, uh, the cryosphere, ice, right. And the fifth, any guesses to what the fifth one is? The biosphere, something that, yeah, so all living things, plants, us, humans, insects. Basically, these satellite systems allow us to look at the entire Earth as a continuous system, and we, we are able to look at all of this information over time. So uh, how is this information applicable to health? Well, a lot of the environmental phenomena that I mentioned are, play either a direct or indirect role on our health. And what we're able to do is to provide public health officials real-time information about what the Earth looks like so that they can respond to public health disasters or using our predictive capabilities, our modeling capabilities, we can get them information ahead of time so that they can try to mitigate these disasters if possible. Okay, so what you see here on your screen is a picture of Lake Okeechobee in Florida. Um, any guesses to what the green squigglies are in the lake? Algae, right. So this picture is from June, uh, July, excuse me, of last year. 
And the algae bloom in this lake was so severe, it covered up to 33 square miles of the lake. And this affected water quality not just in the lake, but all the way downstream, draining into the Atlantic Ocean. Does anybody know how algae are formed? Like, what, what kind of conditions do you think they like? If, if you're in a water body, do you want it to be hot, cold, warm? Right, warm. And what kind of nu nutrients do you think they need? Huh? Sunlight. But, but like, think of like chemicals or uh, nitrogen and phosphorus. So those, those two uh, components are very typical downstream of agricultural fields. So anytime you have water bodies downstream from an agricultural field that is warm climate, you have conditions that are right for algal blooms. Algal blooms aren't necessarily all bad, but some that are bad can be really bad. So it's really important to monitor them. Some of the blooms can release um, hepatotoxins that can cause liver failure. Some release uh, dermatoxins causing skin irritation or neurotoxins. Other can release airborne um, toxins and they can cause trouble breathing or exacerbate asthma conditions. And some are really, really bad. Um, you know, they really bad because now I'm thinking about food. Um, they can cause gastric issues. You can have nausea, vomiting, especially for example, when you think you see those shellfish warnings, like do not fish in this area, do not eat shellfish from this area. You know, those are toxins that are released from algal blooms that can contaminate the shellfish and then in turn make us sick because we're consuming them. So in 2012, actually, this is an image of Lake Erie. And in 2012, you can see the algal blooms that are identified. A lake area is down there on the bottom. And right next to, kind of where the edge of the, um, where the edge, right here, is the city of Toledo, Ohio. And the water quality in this region was so bad that the Ohio city officials in Toledo had to actually issue a do not drink water warning. So 500,000 citizens in that area were affected and couldn't drink water from, from from their main water supply area. So what happened next year is the scientists, uh, public health officials in Toledo, worked with scientists from the Glenn Research Center, which is in Cleveland, Ohio, and they conducted airborne campaigns to look at the water quality in the region. And based on their research, they were able to predict that there was gonna be an even more severe algal bloom the following year. But because they knew that information ahead of time, they were able to get the appropriate water treatment um, protocols in, space, in place and it didn't affect the water, it didn't interrupt water supply for the city of Toledo for the next year. So that's a really good example of how earth observations can help public health officials. Um, another example, is, that's just a zoomed in image, um, who remembers the Zika coverage from last year, right? Um, tremendous, uh, uh, a huge pandemic uh, affecting South America and the Caribbean countries. And um, because of you know, major events in the area, there was the Olympics in Brazil, there was a lot of concern for introduction of the Zika virus into the United States. So what researchers at the Marshall Space Flight Center did is um, they collaborated with other researchers around the world to see if they could use Earth observations to provide data that could help public officials get ready for possible introduction of the virus in the country. So what you're looking at, there's a lot of information on this, but I'm gonna walk you through it. There are about 50 cities that they looked at. The 50 cities are shown here on the map. And these 50 cities are in regions that are already identified as natural hosts for the mosquito vector for the Zika virus. Anybody, bonus points, who can identify the species of mosquito virus that carries the Zika, uh, the species of mosquito that carries the Zika virus? Egypti, yes. Nice, who got it? Oh, good job, yeah. Okay, I was gonna say you saw it on the screen, but you're too far away, so good job, Mike, awesome. <laughs> so Aedes aegypta is the, the mosquito that is the natural host for the Zika virus, and these are 50 cities in the United States that have naturally occurring Aedes aegypti mosquito. So what they did is they looked at three, three environmental conditions. They looked at precipitation, humidity, and surface temperature across the United States from the years 2006 to 2015, so the 10 years before. And based on that 10 years data, they predicted what the conditions would be in 2016. And what they found was that in all 50 cities, the conditions in the summer 
were optimal for Aedes aegypti growth, um, Aedes aegypti to grow and uh, reproduce in all the 50 cities in the summer months. But in winter, most of the cities actually were not inhabitable for, uh, were not habitable for the Aedes aegypti mosquito with the exception of two places, southern Texas and the Miami region in Florida. That becomes important in just a second. So in addition to the mosquito growth, uh, mosquito growth parameters, what the researchers also looked at are two variables as proxies for virus introduction and virus spread in the United States. So they looked at travel into the United States, right? So if you have more travel, you have more of a likelihood for the virus coming into the United States. And the other thing they looked at was socioeconomic status. Now, socioeconomic status is directly related to the likelihood of human interaction with mosquitoes. In poorer regions, you have more, it, it's, a, it's a better setting for a human to encounter a mosquito versus a higher socioeconomic setting. So what they looked at is where would these factors overlap with areas that have high likelihoods of Aedes aegypti growth? And based on those, they identified that the southern Texas and southern Florida region were actually really high for travel into the United States. And the, south, the um, southern United States border with Mexico was really high in socioeconomic conditions that were favorable for the virus to spread. So does anybody remember where the two local transmissions for Zika virus were last year? Local, not, not like brought from travel, yeah. So, um, Texas and Florida. So they actually aligned really well with, yeah, I should have given that hint. <laughs> hint, hint, it actually was true. Um, but yeah, so, so a lot of this information, this predictive capabilities, allowed public health officials to really target their efforts. If you know where majority of the cases are predicted to happen, you know, you, you can target the resources more efficiently and send people to areas where, where they're likely to be needed. So these are just two examples of, um, these are just two examples of how Earth observations help public health officials. A lot of these conditions, harmful algal blooms and vector-borne diseases, are expected to worsen with a warming climate. So a lot of the work that we're doing now is to understand what changes we're anticipating, what are the likely health effects of those changes, and how can we advise for adaptation or mediation me measures for these changes. Um, we have a wide variety of projects that are covered in our portfolio uh, and you know even beyond health and air quality which are the topics that I covered we look at things like water, water resources management, food security, disaster response. So a lot of different projects are under our portfolio and I encourage you to um, visit our website to check out more of these projects. Um, if you have any questions there's my Twitter handle, feel free to shoot a message. And yeah, uh, I, I have time for questions, but if you want to come up to me one-on-one -on -one and the rest of you want to eat lunch, I will understand and not be offended. So thank you so much. Thank you for your time.